Hi, it's Mike Fink, Head of Creator Services at DistroKid. You're listening to the Your Morning Coffee Podcast with my friends Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Weekly music news for the new music business. Let's go Orioles. From Trapital, a breakdown of TikTok's plan to take over. From Billboard, how did two unknown Latin music operators make $23 million from YouTube The IRS says they stole it. And also from Billboard, spam acts use this trick to get songs on a major streaming playlist. Jay, it feels like this is an issue or an episode about scams. Yeah. In the music business, who would have known? (laughs) Who would have thought that that would exist in the music business? Shocking. And on that note, let us relax, Jay. Let us kick back because here we go with episode number 105, right about um, now. Stand by for transmission. This is London calling. Wake up! The revolution is at hand! Your morning coffee is on the air. 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 Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news for the new music business. It's the highly curated, agitated, advocated, moderated, and liberated digital music information that you need to know. We are your digital music authority. Now, from our studios in Hollywood, California, here's your hosts, Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchart. Jay, so good to see you, brother. So good to be chatting. Good to see you, my friend. All of these How wonderful, wonderful shows and stories we're going to talk about. Uh, I am well, oh. by the way. And we, before we, uh, we before we hit record, I was telling you that I saw last night in the little town where I live. They they did a, a in the park um, movie screening of uh, Summer of Soul, which I've already seen, um, but it was so, so lovely. And you know, it's so fun to see these music documentaries and learn stuff. And Summer of Soul, if you haven't seen it, is about the nineteen. 19- 1969 uh, series of events at a park in Harlem and Questlove put the documentary together. It's fantastic. Mm. And it was fun to see it with a group of people. And there was a ton of people there. And, you know, we, we watch movies so frequently now in our house and you don't get that collective group spirit that's happening when, what, which yeah. happened last night. And oh my God, you know, and that movie just brings tears to my eyes for a variety of reasons. But um, oh, it's so, so good. T- tell me about that experience of seeing a movie in the park. Are you, you know, laying down on, you know, blankets with wine and cheese? Is it, you know, like uh, how does there, there were people like? doing that? No, this would, this is in a little venue in the, in the center of town here that has about, I think it seats about six or 700. Um, and it's where Ooh, I saw, nice. I saw Bruce Hornsby there a couple of weeks ago and the zombies. And so we have a number of shows that roll through here, but so this was just a setup for, for a movie. So you're seeing the regular seats, but, uh, they had they yeah. sold ice cream and it was just awesome and the movie if you haven't seen it I'd like to do that it. sometimes that Come. sounds really really I'll cool I'll let you know when they have the next one how's Please. that Please yeah absolutely so very very fun and yeah. good to catch up on that movie again even though I've seen it once before and I also wanted to mention uh you know last week when we were talking about the passing of Mo Austin I was talking about a book that is uh on the Warner on Warner Brothers records specifically and I mentioned that it exists but I didn't mention the name or the or the author right. so the book is called Sonic Boom, The Impossible Rise of Warner Brothers Records, from Hendrix to Fleetwood Mac to Madonna to Prince. It's by uh, Peter Ames Carlin, and it came out in January of 2021, so it's very recent. And if we, if you uh, if you re- get the book and read it, which I highly recommend, you'll you'll see that when the author proposed the book, and everybody who he interviewed said, "You got to talk to Mo," but he's not going to talk to you. And in the end, he did. And uh, I think right. he did two considerable different sessions of, of talking about it. And, uh, you know, we both, you and I both worked for the Warner Music Group at different times. And, sure. Um, 
boy, it's it's hard to build a dynasty, but it's super easy to tear it apart. And that's really what the, the book, especially at the end, is about. So highly recommended. Yeah. And uh, timing-wise, it's... Uh, it's a. It's really. Good. Well, maybe we can talk about it next week because uh, by then we'll both have completed uh, reading it. Um, but I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Indeed. Um, as we get going here, I want to thank uh, our friend Mike Fink over at DistroKid for that yeah. cool intro. When he when he sent that Very to me, pro. it was so pro. I'm like, I sent him a note like were you in radio? <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, I was. It's like, yeah, well, it, it shows. You can tell, you can tell. And you know, as, as, uh, as I'm sitting outside, as the days are getting shorter, it means we're heading into fall. And that means music tectonics is coming up, baby. It's going to be what? October. Oh, one of my favorite. Yeah. October yeah. 25th through 27th, I think. And, uh, I can hardly wait. Yeah. It's going to be really great uh, to be in person again. Um, I had a chance to talk to Dimitri uh, Vitsa from uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors slash um, the Music Tectonics Conference. Uh, just a very uh, knowledgeable experience, just a cool cat. And uh, let's, let's, uh, let's hear what he had to say about uh, the upcoming Music Tectonics uh, Conference. Dimitri, thanks for joining me this morning. Listen, uh, you've got Music Tectonics coming. What can we expect this year? I mean, we're doing something totally different this year. I mean, obviously, we've, we have to do something different because the first the first year was in person. Then we had two online years with the pandemic. But we learned a lot from the experience, really, in terms of what is it that people really want from events like this. We're flipping it on its head. We're only doing in person. We're not doing online um, because we think people really yearn for that. And just like we experimented with different platforms during the pandemic, we're using different venues for different types of experiences. So we've got this three-day conference, Jay. The first day, we're taking over the carousel at the Santa Monica Pier. It should be super fun. Um, it, it'll, it'll be kind of like when you first get to the conference and you like start seeing faces you recognize or meeting people for the first time. That super excitement. We want to have it in a space that feels like a party. And we will have an opening party there. We're also doing what we're calling the startup carousel. So a bunch of the music tech startups that are going to be there will just be right next to an actual merry-go-round where you can kind of circle around and get really quick demos from all the um, basically all the uh, the the people that participated in our uh, swimming with narwhals music tectonic startup competition. So that's just day one, Jay. Um, from there, the next day on October 26th, 6th, we'll be at the Lowe's Santa Monica Beach Hotel, which is a really nice hotel just off of the Muscle Beach in Santa Monica. You can see the water from there um and it's just a beautiful space it doesn't feel like a, a a basement hotel like convention center type vibe and that'll be like a traditional conference we'll have panels keynote we'll have an exhibit hall um our the actual competition the startup competition will take place there so that that'll be a full day with a reception wrapping up at the end of the day and then you know how you go to a conference and you're like oh shoot it's over i didn't have all those meetings that i meant to have or i, I forgot mm -hmm. to see jay or whatever <laughs> We're taking over a place called Expert Dojo on the 27th of October. It's uh, it's this kind of indoor outdoor rooftop venue. It feels kind of like a co working space with open floor plan and uh, and fresh air. It also is right near the beach. And we're calling it the Music Tech Dojo. And really, all it is, we'll, we'll have a couple of a little bit of programming there, but mostly it's just sit down and have a meeting, schmooze with somebody, you know, see that familiar face you forgot to say hi to, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really different. I think it's a different approach with you know end caps so of these really fun sort of venues and then like the full-on conference in the middle i can't wait dimitri thanks so much for joining us i really appreciate it yeah I'll see you there i'm um, looking forward to it yeah, Jay. Thanks. yeah you got it very nice i'm excited i am yeah. excited yeah and, and i i i think i heard a rumor that you might be having a, a panel at the at the event as well yeah, thank you. I'm really excited about it. Um, I've attended, I think this is the third one. Um, I, re I remember attending in person, the very first one. And I know I've at least attended one, you know, virtually. Um, and this is kind of the first one back uh, since the kind of the lockdown. And I'm really excited to meet uh, folks that you and I talk about and talk to every week. It's going to be really great. Again, that's in Santa Monica, October 25th through 27th. But um, what Dimitri uh, told me after we had our little talk is that they've extended kind of the early bird discount um, throughout uh, 
when this podcast goes live, which is today, Monday, August 15th. So if you score your uh, badges uh, by the end of the day today, by midnight Eastern time, you get that early bird uh, pricing. And I I highly encourage everybody to go to the uh, Music Tectonics Conference. It is absolutely one of the best. It's going to be fun. And and like many things, it's going to be fun to be back, you know, to do it in person and we certainly did yeah. a lot of those virtual uh, conferences, and it was nice to have them, but it just wasn't the same buzz. And so I'm, I can no. hardly wait to just kind of bump into people you haven't seen for a while. And uh, yeah, it's going to be yeah. a blast. In beautiful Santa Monica, California, oh, where you, yes. and I, you and I had the pleasure of working uh, for some time. It's just, you know, it's just so stunningly beautiful there, and it's just a perfect setting to kind of get back on the horse. Totally, totally. And that guy, by the way, that I am talking to, who's going to be having a, a panel at that conference, none other than Jay Gilbert. He is the co-founder of music marketing and strategy company Label Logic. He is the curator of the fabulous Your Morning Coffee newsletter and a former executive with Universal Music, Sony Music, Warner Music Groups, and Fox Home Entertainment, and maybe the busiest and most organized person I know. <laughs> I'm highly caffeinated, and this guy sitting across from me is Mike Etchart, longtime host of Sound and Vision Radio, formerly of SST Records, Warner Music Group, Capital EMI, and Universal uh, Music Groups. And it's strange. I thought I was the only one with good taste in music, and <laughs> then I met Mike. So there you go. That's right. Jay and I definitely have an affinity for very similar artists, uh, for sure. And yeah. Jay, uh, the magic of the podcast is, of course, the magic of our listeners, A, but of co- and also the magic of the folks, our wonderful sponsors that help put us together, and we can't thank them enough, but we will try to thank them enough. Uh, the Your Morning Coffee podcast is also brought to you, is or is brought to you by our friends at Bandzoogle, built by musicians for musicians. Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a beautiful website website and EPK for your music. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, including host, hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free, commission-free crowdfunding and fan subscription features, mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send newsletters, uh, social media integrations, and live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Your Morning Coffee podcast listeners can go over to bandzoogle.com and try it free for 30 days and use the promo code Morning Coffee, all one word, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That is bandzoogle.com, promo code Morning Coffee. The Your Morning Coffee podcast is also brought to you by HypeBot. Since 2004, HypeBot has chronicled the new music business and the trends and technologies that are changing how music is discovered, consumed, marketed, and monetized. It's edited daily by founder Bruce Houghton with help from Alana Bonilla. HypeBot and sister blog Music Think Tank are published by live music discovery and marketing platform Bands in Town. And speaking of Bands in Town, over 65 million live music fans trust Bands in Town to get personalized concert alerts, recommendations, and messages from their favorite artists. It's the number one artist services platform connecting over 550,000 artists with their super fans. Managers, labels, agencies, and artists access their own dashboard to manage and promote their tour dates across all platforms. There you have it, Mike. Bands in yes, town. Yes, indeed. HypeBot and our good friends at Banzoogle. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So let us jump into the stories, Jay. The first one, as we were talking again before we hit record, um, this is such a great article that was so succinct. And, and I love the way he laid it out. Um, it's from Trapital. It's a breakdown of TikTok's plans to take over. Take over what, you yeah. say? Maybe take over the world i don't know take over lots of things so uh yeah it's we talk really- a lot about tiktok and and this is the best piece i've read to date on kind of what tiktok does and what their goals are and where they might win and where they might not and you had mentioned this is from uh trapital uh trapital uh it's dan runcy over there who is one of my all-time favorites I don't miss any of his newsletters and I check his site regularly. Nobody knows the world of kind of uh, hip hop and digital music uh, better than Dan Runcie. Um, so um, 
let's let's kick it off. You know, he says it's a breakdown on TikTok's plan to take over. And I just want to run through a few uh, of the points that he lays out initially. And we can kind of go through each section because it's so interesting. Um, he said that every few months, TikTok launches a new feature to go head to head with the biggest companies in music and media. That's a bold statement. Yes, it is. He, he lays out this short list of moves that TikTok has announced just in the last year and kind of who the market leader is in each area. So I'm just going to review a few of these. Extended their video length to 10 minutes. Yep. That competes with YouTube. They yep. launched Sound On, which is a music distribution service we talked about last week. You know, a, a distribution for artists. The competitor there, of course, is DistroKid. Thank you for the intro. Um, they filed a trademark for TikTok music, and that could potentially be a music streaming service to compete with, you know, the likes of Spotify. They've enabled artists to pre-release songs before they go live on streaming, sort of like Twitch. They've enhanced search features to identify terms in comments, sort of like Google slash YouTube. And then lastly, they created their own, you know, NFT marketplace, sort of in competition with OpenSea. That's that's a lot. They are busy beavers over there. <laughs> TikTok. Yeah, that is unbelievable. Um, And needless to say, you know, uh, ByteDance, uh, TikTok's parent company, they're on a mission to eat everyone else's lunch and drink their milkshakes, (laughs) as Dan says. Uh, The Chinese-based company is the fastest growing app to reach 1 billion, yes, 1 billion monthly active users. It has Gen Z in an attention chokehold, and it's scaled back on the uh, and it's scaled, of course, on the back of music. And that's an important yes. point to 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 always, you know, put an exclamation point by. This is really music they are building. They are they are using that as they as they kind of build and expand in their, a big way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but you know, as it as we have you know sit in this space for a long time. There is, su- there, is such a, there is certainly such a thing as overreach, and it is really hard to be good at all the things that you, you attempt to be good at. And right. I think one of the things that, that Dan really kind of did a great job on this is when, as he kind of was predictions on these initiatives, kind of what their likelihood of success is. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a space that, that is so dynamic and yet it's really hard to be good at all the things. And well, let's talk about that yeah. for a second, because I think you make a really important point and that is that it's really difficult to be good at everything. I mean, even Apple, who's had more home runs than any company I can mm-hmm. think of, you know, they've released products that you know, have maybe either fallen flat or haven't performed up to some of their expectations. Yeah, Um, exactly. Some might even argue, you know, Apple TV might be one of those, although I'm such a huge fan of it. Amazon, you know, people forget Amazon launched a phone in competition, you know, with the iPhone and, and Android phones that didn't quite work out. So we always think of the Kindle and we always think of these things at Amazon that were very successful. Same with Apple. But what, Dan is pointing out here is that these guys are going after it across a lot of different verticals and they're going after it hard. And I love the fact that he kind of points out here's some of the areas where they're probably going to be successful and here's some areas they might not be. Yeah, exactly. So if we want to, if we want to jump into his predictions and sure, you know, of course, as, as he said, uh, here's kind of how he predicts each sort of extension or, or addition is going to go. In the case of the 10 minute videos, he said TikTok is the new MTV, which actually is correct. If users enjoy mm-hmm. watching short form videos of entertaining content, they'll watch longer form ones too. If longer videos are available on the app from artists and creators they love, then they'll watch them on the app. He says the likelihood of success is high. And I would agree with him on that yeah. for sure. I, I agree. Let's talk about TikTok music. We've heard a lot about this. No one really knows exactly what it is, but TikTok already has the interest of both artists and record labels, but digital music streaming services need to, you know, consumer buy-in as well. Streaming requires active participation from users. Most people don't passively scroll through Spotify the way they do through TikTok. You know, the better comparison may be YouTube, which relies more on ad-supported revenue than other streaming platforms. So his, you know, prediction of likelihood of success, 
uh, low if it tries to compete with Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, et cetera. But medium if it goes the YouTube route. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm. And by the way, I, I do want to add to that thing about you know certainly uh, companies that that try and fail. That really is an important part of the process too, because sometimes you are surprised, and things sometimes things take you in a completely different direction than you thought they would go. So as a company, you do have to try things, and and if and and, yeah. and expect failure. That is okay. Um, Look at Amazon in the smart speaker market. That yes. wasn't guaranteed that that was going to hit, and. They became the pioneer in the space. Yes, absolutely. So the next one up is TikTok search. As he says, it's easy to find relevant search results on TikTok. I don't Google anymore. I TikTok went viral for a reason. <laughs> the quick results are easy are easy compared to the cognitive overload that can happen with Google and YouTube search results. But it may take time for the SEO to get on Google's level. TikTok's spread of misinformation may hurt its search integrity, but there's plenty of potential mm. to improve. So Dan says the likelihood of success is high, but a few caution flags. Right. Let's talk about sound on. We talked mm-hmm. about that last week. Um, sound on as like music distribution. Artists use TikTok all the time. Labels already want them to release music directly to fans. TikTok already partnered with United Masters, a music distri- uh, distribution service, so it understands the opportunity. But Spotify and others have ended similar programs. Again, we covered that last week on our distribution episode. If you haven't heard that, it's uh, on Billboard's Deep Dive. You should definitely check that out. Um, so customer support costs are quite high, typically, and, and the return on investment needs to be there. So Dan predicts the likelihood of success uh, you know, with sound on distribution at medium. And I would probably add, I would say a little less than medium personally speaking that's what i would say medium rare medium rare yeah exactly uh <laughs> next up is in-app ticket purchasing with ticketmaster ticketmaster has similar similar integrations with youtube and spotify he's sure sure TikTok would love to sell tickets directly without an intermediary like Ticketmaster, but one step at a time. Uh, he's saying the likelihood of success is high, and I'm probably assuming that is correct as well. That's uh, having recently, you know, I've been going to a lot of shows this summer, and you know, we talked about the the the, the insane add-on fees, and God, it's just it has got my attention this summer. Let me tell you. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Now the other elephant in the room here. Uh, for TikTok, and and Dan points this out, you know, the company's quote-unquote geopolitical turmoil. Uh, You know, recent recent reports uh, show that China does have access to TikTok user data and can do surveillance on American users, and that's Mm -hmm. a big deal. You know, while past attempts from the U.S. government to shut down the app have failed, there is looming concern uh, that's not going away, and that's something to consider as we look at some of these uh, predictions, yeah, but they're gonna they're they're still the big Kahuna out there, and they're gonna you know, like we said, they big social net, networks rarely win at everything, and that's what Dan says too. But you got to try, and you got to keep pushing the boundaries and see what clicks and what sticks. And um, yeah. but boy, it's it has changed this business dramatically just in the time that we've been talking yeah. about it. So, you know, it's in that rapid rise was just so rapid. I mean, it was unreal. And here we are. It's, yeah. it is, it's, uh, it's they massive. Are, they are the, charting their future. Yeah. And this is such a great piece. Once again, it's by the founder of Trapital, uh, Dan Runcy. Um, highly encourage you to su- subscribe to his newsletter, check out his site. It's, uh, it's uh, one of the best ones out there. Yes, really good. indeed. Well, the next couple ones are about scams, oh. Jay. And oh my God, when you talk about that, well, well, we'll get into that in a second. The first, these are both articles from Billboard. The first one is how did two unknown Latin music operators make twenty three million dollars from YouTube? The IRS says they stole it. And uh, wow. it's it was a it's a really deep dive article. It's very dense and thick and very interesting. Um, and like you know, Kristen Robinson. Yep. Yeah, and and what what just knocked me out is the amount of money in the relatively short amount of time these guys were able to skim. And it just goes yeah. to show you the amount of money that's going out from this user generated content on YouTube. 
unbelievable amounts of money. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I mean, they, they talk about one example right off the bat, you know, this Jose Chanel, uh, Medina Tehran, um, he's one of the guys that they saw him driving this green Lamborghini, you know, all around West Phoenix, you know, and this is like a $390,000 car. And it got people in town to kind of start going, well, what's, what's going on here? You know, this is interesting. Um, uh, one gentleman um, who wants to remain anonymous said that Phoenix is one of those main points for drug smuggling. So his first thought was, oh, they're doing something like that, you know, or maybe they won the lottery and they're not telling people, you know, it just didn't make any sense. And this is one of the largest, most brazen scams. Um, there was also a piece, uh, Chris Castle, uh, on music technology policy. You know, I'll just read you his um, headline. And, and that was, where was the board? You know, AdRev and YouTube play essential supporting roles in one of the biggest YouTube scams, according to Billboard's reporting. Uh at words by Kristen, and uh, it is a absolutely phenomenal deep dive from Kristen Robinson at Billboard about not only how this went down, but to your point, just the sheer volume of revenue uh, that's being generated. It's it's crazy, and this 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 happened uh, over a four year period. It's also worth kind of <clears throat> mentioning. They mention uh, there's a lot that's in this article, but but you have to understand who AdRev is, and they are, as their website says, they're a comprehensive digital rights management solution that generates unparalleled payouts in earned revenue and found time for creative stakeholders of all types and sizes. They really uh, they have a hybrid approach to, uh, that has that allows for a more thorough detections throughout UGC that's user generated content platforms. They say fewer false claims and reliably higher returns to creators. Well, certainly high returns, in this case, not necessarily to the creators. Um, but these these guys, these two guys, they basically created a company and, um, and AdRev was their back-end people that were accounting to them. And in four years, they were able to get $23 million, which is a ton yeah. of money. And this is principally Latin music. And, you know, we've yeah. talked on this podcast so much about the rise of Latin music. And my goodness, this is just user generated stuff in Latin music. And they, they created a sham company called Media Move, M-U-V. Mm -hmm. And um, they were able to... But what to they did, which was interesting, Mike, is usually the scammers will claim a fraction of yes. a song. And yes. with multiple co-writers, you might not notice that um, right away. And not everybody has access, direct access to like YouTube, CMS, and content ID, right? So that's why you have companies like AdRev. Ad, um, Ad um, sources say YouTube scammers commonly claim small fractions of songs that they suspect have not been claimed properly and might not be noticed. This is especially prevalent on the music publishing side, where there are usually more rights holders, particularly on contemporary songs that credit many songwriters. So the division of ownership and royalties can be very difficult to track. If one or more of the songwriters is known to be without a publisher, there's a strong chance that the writer does not know if their share of the composition is being claimed correctly. Media Move, the scam company that these two guys put together, often claimed 100% of royalties for master recordings or publishing. I mean, that's just crazy. They basically forged documents to show uh, AdRev and in turn, you know, YouTube CMS um, or content manager. Um, and, and that identifies matching sound recordings, you know, and lab it, that enables larger rights holders, including labels, publishers, multi-channel networks, to monitor royalty collection and metadata for all of their musical copyrights. So this was really a, just a brazen scam. Um, it was. You know, we were talking about the movie Office Space and where, you know, this disgruntled employee created this algorithm to basically take a fraction of a penny off of every transaction to kind of, you know, screw the company. This reminded me a lot of that. But instead of taking a fraction of a penny, it's like, no, we're going to take the whole thing. And what's surprising is that it, there were people who noticed it. Mm -hmm. People were, you know, creating videos and talking about it on Twitter. But 
these whistleblowers were saying this is going on, but they were largely ignored initially. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the important things about this story too, to understand is that YouTube's content management system, um, and then they have a, a content ID tool. It's not something that anybody can tap into, right? You, you, it's limited access. And AdRev was one of the companies that that has that access. But it sure seems like, based on this article, that that they, you know, it's some that was the, that was something was happening between YouTube and AdRev that they didn't catch it or they weren't they were they didn't have the eye on the ball. Um, but it's you have mentioned how fantastic and and accurate. YouTube's CMS is. I mean, they're able to pull, they can find music or anything on there quickly and fast and pull it down yeah. or, or identify it. and it, Or at least make it so you can't um, monetize it with advertising on your channel. You and I have seen yes. that where maybe we've had a, a clip of one of the artists that we were talking about. Their content ID identifies that immediately. Yep. And then, of course, we can't create ad revenue on our YouTube channel against that and that that's fair yeah of right course. we're not going to we're not going to generate ad revenue because we featured uh music from one of the artists you know the thing from the chris castle story you know he said that this was one of the biggest youtube scams you know according to billboard and he said that's saying a lot uh thanks to first class investigative reporting by kristen robinson at billboard the story of what looks to be one of the biggest advertising fraud cases can now be told. It involves a whole lot of people looking the other way, starting with the boards of directors of Downtown Music, which owns AdRev, mm -hmm. and then YouTube, you know, which doles out you know, access to content ID. He said that this isn't the first time Google and YouTube have been caught up with some shady dealings due to Google being the paymaster of piracy and hand handing out advertising money, which is the mother's milk of online crime. Uh, Chris has a site called Music Technology Policy, and he says, you know, our readers will recall Maria Schneider's 2016 post, YouTube Pushers of Piracy, that foreshadowed her 2020 lawsuit against YouTube over the effects of YouTube's restrictive access to content ID that you just mentioned. And this is now posed or poised to go to trial. Yeah. So one of the perpetrators, ha um, he basically pled and then another one is going to trial. And I mean, you know, what I was just struck with, though, was, again, the enormous amounts of money we're talking about here. And this, you know, this is a, a relatively not, not a not, it's a it's a ton of money, but it's it's a small part of the overall gigantic amount of money that that is generated from YouTube in terms of user generated content and it's stunning and the audacity of these two guys and you know the the again you know you start it's never a good idea when you buy like a, a $350,000 Lamborghini and you're driving around in a relatively small part of town that people are like looking at and you going what's that about you know and and it's 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 really again thank goodness many criminals are dumb uh if you watch any of those you know <laughs> great uh real uh, television shows about that um sure but it's uh, it's just oh my god i mean it's a staggering amount of money and how this was allowed to slip through the cracks as long as it did is really yeah and what unreal. else is going on if you yeah, talk to people you know inside they'll tell you this this is going on every day it's identified sometimes it's not nefarious sometimes it's just you know there are um, what they call a mismerge where mm -hmm. there'll be two artists with the same name or two songs with a similar uh, title and yeah they're metadata problems and you and I talk about all the time how important accurate metadata is across the board you know one of the things they point out and it was pointed out by somebody named uh, Gabrielle which is a pseudonym that's not who this person's name is um, said they don't give access they meaning YouTube they don't give access to their CMS to everyone for a reason um, this, this person works for different rights management uh, firms and, and represents a number of Media Moves victims. Quote, YouTube wants to have trustworthy partners, understandably, but in the wrong hands, sources say, the transparency of the CMS and content ID tools can be exploited. Yeah, absolutely. And as, as the article points out, typically, uh, like a company like AdRev would, would take about 10%, in case you're wondering what the percentage of these... You know what what they what they keep in terms before they've given out their their share to the artist or in this case the faux artists. Um, 
so there's a lot of pushback on ad rev. It's like, you know, at the very least, you got to give back that 10%. Um, but boy, this is a, a real blemish on ad rev. And, but again, it shows that the, you know, if you are aggressive and motivated, there are ways to skim money and, and to kind of, you know, and we've, we've seen this is, this has kind of been around since the beginning of digital music. And, you know, you, you would see kids putting up, you know, songs that they didn't own, you know, or albums that had never been posted up on, on the digital services and things like that. Yeah. And, and this is just kind of the latest in, in another, you know, and, and they talk about, you know, there are ways to kind of research and see if perhaps some, you know, like we, we talked about, a lot of these songs have multiple uh, co-writers and things like that. And if, if just one of the five, let's say, doesn't have a publishing deals in place or something like that, there are ways to exploit that. And there are people out there looking all over for opportunities like this to, to skim money. And yeah. you're talking about gigantic amounts of money. So it's just, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a it's an amazing story, and like you like you said, the 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 depth of the of the research that went into it, and it's such an interesting read. And this is just things yeah. that we're going to have to keep paying attention to because this is is as you said, some you know metadata is so crucial, and it's so easy to to have incorrect meta, metadata, to have all of these sort of conflicts and things like that. That um, there's just going to be we're, we are. The, the the playing field is so ripe for things like this still. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it focuses on the point that there needs to be much greater transparency and access um, to this information. Um, I wanted to point out that it wasn't just these two gentlemen that they talk about in the piece. There were f- over five co-conspirators. Right. Yes. Right. Um, that were paid a portion of Media Moves uh, royalties. So uh, one of them was one of the... Uh, um, principal's wife. Um, she had purchased a $590,000 house in Phoenix paid for entirely with cash. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oy, all right. A great read, right. a wonderful job. And it's, it reads like, um, you know, like something you would see like a documentary. I mean, great job for, uh, by Kristen over at billboard and, yeah, check it out. It's it's so good and so amazing. Yeah. And then the, here we have the next one from Billboard. Uh, spam acts use this trick to get songs on a major streaming playlist, and you, you've seen this as uh, well. It it's I have. Oh, yeah, boy, it is. So, it's yeah. This piece was written by Elias Late. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about Elias a lot. He's written some really great uh, pieces. Um, I think he pronounced his last name Late. Um, Elias wrote this this piece for Billboard, and uh, you know people are trying to game streaming by uploading songs that claim to feature popular acts, except the bigger artists have no involvement. So consider, you know, uh, a song's recorded, and you just might put, oh, this is Jay and Mike, but we're featuring Drake, and you release it, <laughs> and before anybody has a chance to really check it out. It drops into people's, you know, release radar or Discover Weekly, and they generate tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of streams from Drake fans thinking that he's involved in some way. And be, by the time they get around to it uh, and discover it, and and listen, sometimes they don't discover it. There's it's it's whack a mole. There's so many of these things yeah. happening right now, and there is a statement in here that we'll read from Spotify about what they're doing to combat it. But this is a huge problem, much bigger than most people realize. Well, and if you're Spotify, you know, it, it just takes the wind out of the sails of Release Radar, which is, you know, that's that's such a, a gigantic um, tentpole thing for them. And then and then you, you have people like maybe writing on Reddit, you know, I stopped listening to my Release mm-hmm. Radar because I was getting multiple of these fake tracks in there every week, one uh, Spotify user wrote. And so this is a super serious problem. And... But it, yet it's so easy to do. It's so easy to perpetrate. Um, and it can take a long time for it to get flagged. And, you know, if, of right. course, and we, we've talked about this all the time, which is why do people use spin farms and bots and all of this other stuff? Because they want more more plays. And, you know, it's, yeah. is, is it does it have a, a, a bad ending no matter what it does yet that does not stop people from doing it and this will continue to be a problem right. um 
Yeah, you give me any technology, brother, and someone is going to try to uh, game it. And listen, Spotify is aware of this. In a statement, a spokesperson for Spotify said that stream manipulation and content misrepresentation are industry-wide issues that Spotify takes seriously and are against our policy and policies. And people will remember we had Jen Mosse on from Spotify a few weeks ago yep. uh, about this very topic. Um, the, the statement goes on to say that we have robust, active mitigation measures in place that identify bad actors, limit their impact, and penalize them accordingly. We are continuously evolving our efforts to limit the impact of such individuals on our service. You know, Spotify launched release radar almost you know, six years ago in the, in the summer of 2016, quote, we were trying to show that Spotify understands users better than anyone else. That was uh, Edward Newitt, um, who served as the features lead engineer. He told TechCrunch at the time, quote, we're the biggest in terms of leveraging streaming data to bring the personalization necessary to make this feature work. And I, I talk to people all the time about release radar. It works really well. Yes. And as Will Page told us, it's not necessarily all about discovery. A lot of times it's about rediscovery, mm -hmm. you know, maybe an artist or an album that you love and serving you up something that may not be the biggest hit off of that album or something that follows along with what they know you're going to love. And I got to tell you, it's, it's scary accurate at some of the things that it serves oh, yeah. up. Oh yeah. But if we put out, you know, you know, I like the Beatles. And if you put out a song that says, you know, here's my new song featuring Paul McCartney before they catch that, that might drop into my release radar and generate a lot of spins for you. And it's, it's a really challenging uh, problem because you take down one and then somebody else does it. And you know, it's, again, it's whack-a-mole. It's whack-a-mole. And, you know, in terms of the timing of this, uh, this guy, Brett Rosenberg, who's a musician and blogger, he's written about this a lot. He said he started to see it pop up regularly about a year ago, although there are some sort of Reddit complaints going back uh, to at least 2020. It became more and more a nuisance on a weekly basis, he says, to the point where a dud duet would appear three or four times every Friday when his release radar resets. Um, and so... You know, again, you're dilute. If you're Spotify, this is the worst thing in the world for you because you it's diluting the effectiveness of that product. Like you said, it's super effective. Yeah, it's it, it works, baby. Yeah, and um, yeah. yeah, and it's just it's super hard to com to to. I mean, it's so easy to do, and it's hard to combat. And it, it's uh, it, it really keep is. Doing I mean, it. We talk about it so often that that data is so important, that accurate um, uh, metadata. And I think that, you know, distributors are also in this game of producing things. And uh, I'm not sure how robust their tools are when somebody through one of these uh, DIY distributors has, you know, a feature that they list in their metadata, you know, with the volume, uh, you know, it's like 79,000 different ISRCs, not different songs, but different ISRCs are uploaded every day on uh, the streaming services. That's that's a lot of data to look through and, and fact check. And last week, we, um, we talked about a story. And in the story, there was a chart uh, from the CMA about basically where do playlist streams come from. Mm -hmm. And from this study, they broke down Spotify, YouTube Music, Apple, and Amazon. And they kind of listed like, well, where do a majority of the streams come from? Let's just take Spotify, for example. Only 5 to 10% come from editorial uh, playlists. 10 to 20% come from algatorial, which again, we talked about that last week, these personalized playlists. Um, very few spins, you know, uh, less than 5% come from radio, um, 5 to 10% from autoplay. But here's, here's the point. Almost 60% come from user curated playlists where you people are creating their own and another 10 to 20% are people just going not to a playlist but directly to someone's artist page and just listening uh, to that music. So a, a majority of the spins across YouTube music, Apple music, Amazon, Spotify are really coming from people creating their own playlists or going right to the artist page. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, that because this is happening primarily with release radar and release radar on Spotify is really big. I'm just saying that it is a big problem, but there are other ways that people are consuming music. 
Right. What's interesting, too, is, is this article ends by saying, you know, there is a financial incentive to gaming release radar. Um, you know, a fake collaboration between an unknown and established act the, that has a million followers on Spotify can generate between 50,000 and 100,000 streams in about 24 hours. But crazy. So, how, but what are we talking about money wise? Well, that's maybe 100 bucks, 200 bucks. So it's not. A super ton of money. And, and they're kind of saying that, you know, people are saying, uh, you know, okay, yeah, so it, not that $100 is insignificant, but it's not giant money. So really, what is the end game for this? Is If it's not money, what is the end game? And a lot of people are kind of scratching their heads saying, ah, you know, just to get it on release radar, I suppose, kind of bragging rights. Um, yeah, it, it, Maybe it's scale. Somebody told me that yeah. part of the scam, the, the point that I might have been missing was it's not about that individual song. It's someone doing this across multiple True. tracks right. and maybe having a few of them that are caught and pulled down, but they just continually do it. Um, but I know that Spotify uh, is actively uh, pursuing this. I would imagine that you know all the other DSPs are are. Um, looking to take care of this problem as well. But these last couple of stories that we talked about just illustrate two separate kind of scams for this new music business. And we both know there's many others. You and I talk about bots and spin farms all the time. You know, it's, but the music industry, as much as we love it, we grew up in this business that's always had you know, unscrupulous people trying to mm-hmm. game the system. Uh, the, there are just legendary stories over the years about how people have tried to do it. And the technology makes it more difficult in some ways and easier in, in others to kind of game that system. And we know that there's going to be more scams and that there are some that we're not even talking about. But the good news is, you know, with uh, with these DSPs, um, they are working hard to identify them and then, you know, mitigate the circumstances. Yes, yes. And and it's, you know, it's always been a lucrative business during the physical years and now, but it's just the money still is so giant and in ways that we couldn't comprehend even five years ago. Um, But I, you know, I still go back to that first article when you, when you looked at, so they were doing this for four years and they pulled down $23 million. Boy, that is a lot of change. And, yeah. That's just goes to show you how much how much revenue is generated on the publishing side, on the master side in in this new music business, and yeah. it's yeah. what were, I'm curious about is did they get greedy and that's why they got caught by taking a hundred percent? I would imagine there are act, bad actors out there who are taking a very small piece mm-hmm. and are going unnoticed with that, Correct. and again at volume could be. Uh, bringing in a lot of money. It's just so challenging um, without that transparency to really check and make sure. And I would encourage any rights holders out there, whether you're a songwriter, um, artist manager, where, whatever, wherever you land, to make sure that you audit these things and check them and make sure that they're accurate um, and do it regularly. Because this is, to your point, this is a, a big problem and a lot of money. Well, and what really tripped them up too was the IRS getting involved, and that, you know they were they were like you said had had they kind of skimmed along uh, in a much less uh, obvious way without just going for the gusto and saying I own all this stuff, you know, like you said, kind of taking small pieces, they may never would have been caught, or or, or it would have been a slap on the hand, you know. They talking about getting right. greedy, they did get greedy, and the, yeah. you know when you're driving around with a, a brand new Lamborghini and people start asking questions and. Once the IRS gets involved, it's, it's an entirely different level. And so that right. really was their right. Downfall. But what happens when you're not in the U.S.? You know, what happens right. like some of these bots and spin farms exactly. are in countries that don't take piracy as, uh, uh, you know, as seriously as we do. Correct. Um, that's a fear as well that some of these these knuckleheads, yeah, they were in Phoenix and they got noticed. And there were people who were trying to be whistleblowers and tell what was going on. But... You know, it's it's a lot more challenging to police, you know, other countries that just, you know, don't care about intellectual property. And I think I've mentioned this before, this little catalog that I manage. Um, it was probably about six or seven years ago. All of a sudden, there were all of these. Um, it, this was through the orchard that the orchard was the, the folks that were managing the 
that I we went through, um, and it was suddenly all you know you 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 have these um, notices when somebody claims that they have rights to your thing, and all of a sudden the, for this little catalog that I was managing, all of these things came in from China. A lot of them were Tencent claiming publishing rights on things that we knew they didn't have rights on. But the challenge at that time was so so I was kind of managing the catalog, and so I was reaching out to the people with whom we were we were collecting on their behalf and sometimes I couldn't get back to them and t- they wouldn't respond in time. And so it was, it was kind of basically like a phishing campaign because they just knew that if, if they, if, if they challenged the rights, um, call it a hundred, 20, 25, maybe wouldn't respond, wouldn't see it in time, didn't know whatever happened. Boom, all of a sudden you've got some rights now. And so th- th- that was another sort of a scam that happened. So there's all of these things that are going on all the time. And people just, again, it's a, as they say, the, the, the music business publishing world w- is a business of pennies. But as we saw from, from Office Space, <laughs> you know, you could, when you do when you just stealing, pennies add up, pennies add up. And so it's, this is not going to end, but uh, you know, you see these waves of different scams, so to speak. And anybody who, if you know, who works in law enforcement, this is the way crime works is they're, they're, you know, criminals latch onto something and then they do that till that doesn't work anymore. Then they have a new scam and this will, we, we will continue to report on these stories as newer yes, scams absolutely. happen. And we, yeah. it's just, there's opportunities. There are lots of opportunities yeah. to potentially skim yeah. money. So great stuff from Billboard. Again, yeah. we say this all the time. I mean, this was, a, a especially the first story, was such a deep a article. I mean, and I had to. I, I read it twice because it was so interesting. A, and so much. It, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I had to look up certain things because I was kind of curious. Oh and yeah. It was a. And fun we're just deep scratching dive. the surface of that piece from yes. Kristen Robinson. Um, this is a very thorough, uh, deep dive. You know, into how these people um, scammed uh, YouTube, and I'm I'm glad that Chris Castle's talking about it. It just raises the profile even higher. Um, it's, it's an issue, but you know, we're addressing it same with the, uh, you know, adding fake, uh, artists onto your, your track to gain, you know, release radar streams. And, uh, one last final shout out to Dan Runcie for the, uh, the breakdown on TikTok's oh, yes. plan to take over. So good. And, uh, you know, Mike Fink, thank you for the, uh, the intro and Dimitri, thanks for talking to us about the uh, Music Tectonics Conference. Don't forget, if, you, uh, if you're listening to this on the day that it comes out, which is Monday, uh, August 15th, um, make sure that you uh, get that early bird special for uh, Music Tectonics. And I can hardly wait for that event. That's going to be so fun. I'm looking forward to yeah. it and seeing a bunch of people. And, of course, Jay will be there with his credit card buying drinks for everybody like there's no tomorrow. Hey, you wh- know? Wh- wait, 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 what? He's just a generous, generous <laughs> man. So uh, if you see Jay oh, and just give him your drink order, he'll he'll get, get it happening for you. Uh, we do want to thank, of course, Banzoogle. Hypebot and Bands in Town for uh, rocking our world and helping us put the podcast together. Without them, we could not do this. And of course, thanks for everyone that listens. We we hear great stories and it's uh, so gratifying and we are humbled when we hear folks say, hey, I listen to your podcast and I enjoy it and it's an important part of my week. So uh, yeah. that puts a smile on our face and boy, boy, we, we can't thank you all enough for that. So on behalf of of the 33rd hardest working man in show business, Jay Gilbert and myself. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. We'll be back next week on the Your Morning Coffee podcast. You've been listening to Your Morning Coffee, the weekly music news program for the new music business. Join Jay Gilbert and Mike Etchard next time for the digital music news you need to know.